Right. Thanks. Thanks, Candice, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining and welcome to the session. Uh, so when we talk about the modern storage architectures in the modern application, it is evident that the cloud has become the most reliable and most cost-effective uh, mode of uh, data storage. So in today's webinar, we'll explore how streaming data applications can leverage the cloud storage to build uh, infinite uh, data storage solutions. And we'll also uh, explore a couple of other business use cases that we can build around this cloud-first storage model. Let's get started. Uh, so Candice uh, did a little bit of introduction to me. So let me add a few things uh, as well. So I'm Dunit Danushka, a senior developer advocate from Red Panda. Uh, so uh, my background is, uh, so I'm a solutions architect and a developer advocate uh, with a background in stream processing, uh, real-time analytics, and big data. And uh, with my experience in uh, designing and building uh, uh, real-time uh, uh, distributed applications, I can uh, bring in this experience to the Red Panda community and uh, help uh, Red Panda developers educate and uh, use uh, uh, these, uh, build these architectures at scale. All right, uh, so that's about me. So let's look at the agenda today. So first I'll talk about uh, the storage fundamentals and I'll walk you through, uh, I'll give you a, a bit of a, a refresher on the storage fundamentals and we'll uh, talk about how these uh, storage architectures have been evolving over time for uh, st uh, streaming data platforms. And then we'll talk about the tiered storage and what problems it can solve. And then I'll introduce you to the uh, cloud-first storage model. And then we talk about uh, the storage, uh, uh, different business use cases we can build on top of that. And finally, we'll uh, uh, talk about potential business benefits that you can gain from having a cloud-first storage model in your organization. And then we'll open up for a couple of few, uh, questions as well. All right, let's get started. Uh, right, before we take a, a deep dive into the cloud-first architecture and uh, its internals, I think for us, it's it will be important to uh, understand the basics of uh, cloud uh, streaming data uh, platforms storage model. So, uh, when when I when I mention streaming data application, I specifically focus on streaming data platforms. So because when you talk about any uh, event driven uh, real time streaming application, uh, these uh, questions, this uh, streaming data platform uh, act as the centerpiece of this architecture, right? So. So going forward, I'll take Red Panda as the different implementation here. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Red Panda, it's a streaming data platform, uh, API compatible with Apache Kafka. Uh, so that means uh, if you already have a Kafka producer, Kafka consumer, you can seamlessly integrate that application with Red Panda because uh, Red Panda offers compatible read and write interfaces. Also, Red Panda brings in additional uh, advantages over Kafka in terms of high performance and simplicity in operations and also uh, durability in uh, handling data as well. So, so yeah, so that's about Red Panda. So I'll, uh, as we uh, progress through the presentation, I'll uh, take a couple of examples uh, related to Red Panda and its uh, cloud-first storage model so that we can have a, a contextual uh, knowledge in the uh, particular slide. Right, so when we talk about the, uh, the early days of this uh, streaming data architecture, so streaming data platform, in the beginning, there was no streaming uh, platform at all. So it was all governed and dominated by this uh, enterprise messaging solutions. So in the beginning, uh, so whenever a business needs to have a messaging solution in place, uh, there were these messaging vendors, they came up with their offerings. So back in the day, the compute storage and hardware, uh, the software, everything came up in single monolithic solution. So 
the vendors come came on site and they installed the whole thing together configured them uh, get it up and running as a business when you want to have a more uh, when you want to scale up or scale down again the vendors has to come there and do their uh, configuration so but this model has been disrupted uh, uh, by rabbit mq in 2007 so they first introduced this uh, uh, open source model for messaging and that allows many organizations to deploy uh, open source uh, rabbit mq solution on their own hardware and uh, scale up and scale down as needed. So that's, that was the first disruption. And then we had uh, Kafka uh, at LinkedIn. So Kafka was the first uh, streaming data platform of its kind. Uh, so by that time, storage has becoming more cheaper and that, that time was the beginning of the big data era. So Kafka was designed to leverage uh, the uh, cheap disk so that they could build a, a faster and more fault tolerant uh, streaming ingestion system. And in the meantime, Apache Pulsar also came into the picture with a, a key signi uh, significant differentiator in mind. So that was the uh, tiered storage, I would say. Uh, so, so Pulsar decoupled this uh, storage and compute uh, together. So, so that allows uh, customers to scale their uh, storage uh, independent of the compute options and uh, when we travel back to today so when we compare uh, today's hardware and software operations especially in the hardware in the modern world has made a lot of improvement for example we have uh, the virtual machines in very tall configurations like 96 cores of vms and especially when talk about the data st storage structures we have uh, ssds uh, more faster and more cheaper compared to the early days. And then uh, when we compare these streaming data platforms like uh, Kafka, Pulsar, and Red Panda uh, against its, uh, the database world, uh, specifically relational and NoSQL databases, there's a fundamental difference. So that is, these uh, streaming data platforms have been designed for, uh, to support immutable append-only storage in mind. So what does that mean? It means that once you write a record into the streaming data platform, you can't go back and uh, modify it in place. Whereas in, uh, the, in the database world, uh, so it operates on a page-oriented uh, 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 storage model where you can uh, specifically, specifically specify where the specific record should go. And once you write that, you can always search it with a key or some sort of a modifier and you can uh, update it in place. So that's the fundamental difference. So with that uh, storage model, uh, so we usually call it log structured uh, storage engine for streaming data platforms. So, uh, so when we talk about Kafka, so it, it is powered by the sequential writes and you know, sequencer writes are always faster and uh, uh, the primitive unit of this storage engine was this uh, distributed log file. Uh, so we can call it partitions and, and this is replicated across different machines so that uh, we can recover it from failures. So that was the uh, uh, local only storage model. Uh, but but there was a fundamental uh, limitation in this local uh, is log structured storage engine model. That is, everything is scoped to the local disk. Uh, so initially that was the uh, the design purpose. But as uh, these logs grow, uh, as the time grow, uh, as the time as the as more data comes in, these logs grow in size. So that will lead us to two uh, fundamental problems. Let's look at them. First one, first problem is your streaming data platforms, storage capacity, total uh, write capacity is bounded by the uh, aggregated capacity of your local disks. So uh, you can't, uh, it is difficult to scale, uh, go beyond that, uh, the total uh, local disk sizes. So let me put that into a perspective by uh, taking an example. Let's say we have a Kafka cluster that has a total uh, local capacity of 100 gigabytes, 
right? And uh, let's say we are ingesting uh, uh, from a stream with the throughput of uh, one gigabyte uh, per second. Uh, let's imagine uh, we enabled the replication factor as three. Uh, at this ingestion rate, the cluster will run out of a local disk space uh, within a few minutes. So there are certain ways to mitigate this. Uh, for example, you can easily enforce these retention controls on local data so that we can instruct the streaming data platform to purge data after a specific point in time. For example, we can instruct Kafka to keep only uh, the last hour's data and uh, purge or delete or compact, uh, topic compaction, uh, the, uh, the older data. So those are the few implications we have this in uh, this local only model. And then uh, the, the other problem is, uh, and then uh, just to add to this one. So the second option is, to always provision new hardware into the existing cluster so that we can uh, get more uh, disk space so that we can accommodate more data. So that's the second option. Uh, <clears throat> the pro second problem is this, uh, even after you provision more uh, hardware, more disk, uh, these disk, uh, the nodes still keep getting bigger and bigger as new data comes in. And that will result in uh, uh, slow migrations and uh, slow recovery of these nodes. So let's say, for example, if you want to migrate an existing cl uh, cluster to a different region in cl cloud, the migration will take a lot of time because there's a lot of data to be moved and uh, this will result in uh, cross-regional, uh, more uh, trans uh, re replication costs, as well as uh, this will result in uh, taking a longer time to recover from uh, crashes because in order to reinstate the crash node state, there's a lot of data must be moved. So because of this limitation in the local only storage, uh, people came up with uh, the, the other option, the tiered storage. So tiered storage in conceptually, it's about having different uh, storage tiers in your application to support different uh, data access needs. Uh, say for example, as far as we uh, can, uh, consider streaming data platform, uh, you can uh, place uh, frequently accessed and most hot or uh, most re uh, recent data in an expensive but fast uh, local disk uh, like SSDs. And you can offload or you can uh, move uh, all the uh, log segments into a more cheap and uh, but reliable uh, storage medium like a S3 bucket. So that way you can decouple uh, your uh, cluster from uh, the uh, compute from the storage. So this is uh, this is not new in the streaming uh, space. So in fact, uh, Apache Pulsar has had this conceived and then uh, Kafka uh, quickly uh, caught up with this. Um, so that was the tiered storage. And when it comes to Red Panda, so we have the tiered storage uh, uh, support now. Uh, I'll talk about this tiered storage in, uh, in a different slide in very detail, but for now you can think of uh, tiered storage is enabled by two APIs, uh, the write, remote writes and remote reads. So when you configure tiered storage, uh, Red Panda can move, asynchronously move uh, all the data into a cloud storage bucket, something like S, uh, Amazon S3 or Google Cloud Storage. And then uh, same data can, can be read in the read interface. So when we talk about uh, Red Panda in specific, I'll talk about, I'll dive, uh, dive deep into this. So even though if you enable tiered storage, there are some limitations. I mean, this is not the uh, silver bullet uh, for uh, our storage problem, but uh, the thing is, uh, there are certain life cycles in this uh, tiered storage that had to be manually administered by some administrator or an operator. For example, uh, once you move the data into a storage bucket, uh, it is no longer, most of the time, it is no longer under uh, streaming data platform's jurisdiction. That means, uh, you cannot force the streaming data platform to purge uh, the data in uh, storage bucket uh, uh, 
uh, after certain time period of time. So there were some sort of uh, short uh, shortcomings of this model. So by considering the limitations of this local only storage and the tiered storage, uh, what if we make the cloud the default storage engine for streaming data platforms? So seems like a very interesting idea. Yes. So as far as we consider streaming data platform, this means a true cloud first storage engine means a stream, uh, uh, whenever we uh, whenever this streaming data platform accepts a new message from a producer, it will first store it in the uh, cloud remote cloud uh, storage bucket, something like a S3 or Google Cloud Storage. And then once you consume it, it will, uh, the, you can just consume this uh, record uh, by send, sending a fetch request. Uh, so uh, it will consume the same message from the uh, storage bucket. So there are certain ways we can optimize this operation. We'll talk about that in detail once we uh, uh, go uh, go through the presentation. So this kind of cloud-first storage model uh, enables different uh, opportunities for streaming data platforms. Uh, the first one being it enables infinite data storage in the cloud and makes your data portable across multiple locations. Uh, for example, we saw earlier, so in local storage, uh, your cluster's write capacity is bounded by uh, the uh, total size of your local disk. But when you configure your cluster to work with cloud uh, storage buckets, there's virtually no limit. So you can scale as much as you want. And, and uh, so that's one thing. And also you can back up your cluster's data into a storage bucket and uh, quickly spin up a different uh, uh, cluster in some other location, or you can even move it to a different region. So there are some other benefits as well. Second benefit is the, uh, the unparalleled reliability offered by these cloud vendors, especially uh, when you consider object stores like AWS S3 or Google Cloud Storage, they usually provide uh, 11 nines of reliability at SLS. So that is far more better than uh, using your own data center. And, and, and also you don't need to worry about maintaining it over time. Another advantage would be obviously the cost because uh, in, uh, you know, uh, in usually in storage buckets, uh, the cost to store one terabyte of data is relatively uh, negligible. Uh, it's relatively very uh, small compared to the local disk, which is quite expensive in most cases. Uh, as far as Red Panda is concerned, uh, Red Panda supports uh, cloud as of its, its default storage engine, or default uh, storage tier uh, since its 22.3 uh, release. So currently we support uh, uh, AWS S3 and Google Cloud Storage as uh, storage destinations and the support for Azure, uh, Microsoft Azure storage blobs, blobs is coming up in a way. So uh, there are, couple of uh, interesting features we develop in order to power this uh, cloud first storage model so i'll talk this uh, i'll i'll talk to these features at a very high level but uh, you can just you can it is not tied to red panda so you can take this uh, design principle as your guidelines for your uh, next uh, streaming data project and you can apply it to uh, in a uh, different context outside of that so underneath this internal uh, cloud first storage model, we have the cloud first storage engine. So this is the foundation. There we have the primitive feature, shadow indexing. So shadow indexing is the mechanism that moves your uh, moves uh, all the log segments, uh, partition uh, the log files into the remote uh, cloud uh, storage bucket. So the beauty here is it happens asynchronously and transparently to the uh, underlying user. So let's say you are, if you are an operator or an administrator, you don't have to worry about that because Red Panda can take care of that. 
And, and once you move that data to the cloud, uh, this unified retention controls allows you to uh, impose or uh, enforce uh, retention policies on uh, cloud data uh, as similar to you do that on the local data as well. Say, for example, you can instruct Red Panda to uh, uh, purge the data stored in the S3 bucket after uh, one month or one week. So it's totally up to you. So th the good thing is uh, it is totally under uh, streaming data platforms governor. So there's no need of manually going there, uh, manually logging into the uh, AWS console and purging it manually. So it is also taken care by the underlying streaming data platform. And then uh, what does this mean by you as a developer or a producer or a consumer application? So, so the beautiful thing is it is not uh, directly exposed to you. So all you see here is the producer and consumer APIs which are compatible with uh, Kafka. So as a consumer, uh, you would read uh, uh, these uh, data stored in the cloud by uh, sending a fetch request. So by controlling the offset, you can switch between different locations. So, so it's up to Red Panda based on the offset. We can uh, fetch from the cloud or we can fetch from the local storage based on the uh, configuration. So in order to make this uh, reads optimized, we build this uh, read and write cache at the uh, uh, read site. So that's the foundation that paves the way for the cloud first storage model. And on top of that, we have built several other capabilities as well. The first one is tiered storage. Uh, uh, I discussed that earlier. So basically tiered storage allows you to uh, break your uh, storage into multiple tiers. So that means you can combine the local storage with the cloud storage so that you can serve most recent uh, data from the local storage while keeping the historical, historical data in the cloud as well. And secondly, we have the read replicas, uh, which is another uh, interesting feature um, powered by the fast rehydration capability uh, built into the shadow indexing. Uh, so, so, the, so you can think of these read replicas as mirroring a topic in Kafka in different clusters. So for example, you have a Red Panda cluster in one region and you can create a read replica in a different location or could be a, in a different geographical region. And then you can select a topic from the original cluster to mirror at the destination. Uh, all you need to do is point that topic to uh, a specific uh, cloud storage bucket, then it can rehydrate faster and catch up with the uh, uh, original topics content, including the offset locations and configuration. All right. so. So that so that's the basics of uh, the cloud first storage model. I hope you get a got an understanding on that. Now we get to the meat of the session. So that's we are going to talk about a couple of use cases uh, that we can build around this cloud storage model. First one is the uh, instant disaster recovery. Uh, you know when you run uh, streaming data architecture. A disaster recovery is strategic uh, to your architecture because it allows you to uh, reinstate your application's business state uh, after a failure. So usually you, uh, when we consider Kafka or any other streaming data platform, we usually enable this by, this by uh, deploying Kafka clusters in multiple geographical locations so that we can uh, isolate uh, four domains. So, and then uh, we can enable cross-region data replication uh, through tools like Mirror Maker. Uh, so there are so many ways to do that, like cluster linking, and there are so many techniques to do that. But uh, the thing is, uh, most of the time it requires you to have a uh, active uh, standby DR cluster at some geographical region, and uh, you have to also incur uh, absorb some cost in uh, cross-region replication. But when this cloud-first storage comes, uh, you, can, you have to think always in, uh, your data is always portable in cloud. 
So there's a central uh, storage bucket that holds your entire cluster's data set. So that allows you to uh, uh, spin up, a, quickly spin up a, a red panda cluster when we talk about red panda. So you can quickly spin up a red panda cluster and let it hydrate uh, from that storage bucket quickly. And uh, usually it will take about a couple of seconds uh, because of this fast uh, indexing and other features we built in. And, and then it will it can also reinstate the last known uh, uh, offset locations, of, offset uh, configurations as well, so that your old uh, existing consumers can smoothly fail over to the, this uh, newly built uh, DR cluster. So this is one uh, good use case for this uh, cloud-first storage model. Second use case is uh, the fast scaling up and uh, scaling down of uh, clusters. When we uh, so when, when it comes to uh, especially retail and uh, e-commerce workloads, you know there are certain periods where we can expect seasonal traffic, right? Like uh, Cyber Mondays and Black Friday seasons. So how do we tackle this kind of situation? So usually, what we do is we provision new clusters to handle that uh, traffic. So usually, what we usually do is uh, when when there's no way of predicting the traffic. We usually over-provision the hardware, and most of the time it is underutilized, and some at some certain points it is utilized to the full extent. But most of the time it is sitting idle at some places. But yeah, so with this cloud-first storage model, uh, you can follow the same approach as DR clusters. You can quickly spin up a cluster, and uh, when 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 you feel like there's a need of uh, spinning up a uh, have a provisioning new compute and storage power, you can quickly spin up a cluster and have it uh, rehydrate from the uh, cloud storage bucket. Also, the, the other way around is po also possible. Uh, let's say you, you don't need the additional cluster at some point because the season is over. And then you can quickly decommission it by uh, simply uh, shutting it down and then uh, it won't take much time because the nodes are smaller in size and the major portion of data resides in the cloud and uh, decommissioning will also take less time. So this will enable ad hoc scaling and scaling up and scaling down. Uh, another use case would be to offload uh, non-priority workloads from uh, operational or user-facing uh, workloads. Let's say, for example, you have a red panda cluster running in somewhere else, and so it is it's running this fraud detection, uh, which is critical to its business, and it has strict SLS. At the same time, this same cluster is being shared by the analytics team for uh, you know, fulfilling uh, something like non-priority uh, analytics tasks like running or training a machine learning model or running uh, 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 respond into a compliance reports or something like that. Since the workload is shared in the same uh, cluster, most of the time this will affect the SLS of the operational workload, that is the uh, fraud detection thing. But you can avoid this situation by uh, spinning up uh, or creating a read replica in a different cluster. So. With read replicas, you can mirror whatever the topics you want uh, to have in this uh, different new cluster, newly spawned cluster. And uh, once you provision it, uh, you can offload, you can uh, give it to the analytics team so that they can uh, leisurely run, run their uh, analytics workloads without impacting the performance of the operational cluster. So this is a good uh, pattern to uh, uh, follow. Uh, so basically, you can offload uh, analytics from operational clusters in this use case. Another use case would be to build stretch clusters that span across multiple uh, geographical regions, but will act as a single unit. So you can control it from a single control plane. Uh, so this use case will be powered by this Red Panda's rack awareness capability. So in that case, uh, uh, 
cross-region replication is inevitable, but uh, Red Panda can intelligently decide when to replicate and when not to. By that way, you can save uh, a cost. And then finally, uh, another use case would be to provide a single interface to access uh, both real-time and historical data. You know, this is made this is made possible by this uh, tiered storage and fast rehydration capability. Uh, so, uh, for example, you can combine the local storage uh, for and uh, cloud storage uh, to serve two different uh, audiences. For example, you can keep most recent data in the cloud and you can serve uh, real-time uh, operational use cases like fraud detection or real-time analytics use cases, stream processors kind of thing. And then uh, you can also offload historical infrequently accessed data to the cloud and uh, you can serve that data to other uh, teams like machine learning teams and uh, ad hoc analytics teams and these kind of use cases. But the beauty is both of these teams will see uh, a single interface that is your consumer API. So you will use the single fetch API to fetch all these uh, data and you can specify how much data you need and for how long you, you want to go back in time by specifying the offsets. So based on that offset value, Red Panda can decide whether to fetch data from the cloud or from the uh, local storage. So by that way, you don't have to maintain two different systems. Uh, you don't have to have a data lake at all. So you can treat your cloud storage as uh, the uh, data lake at some point. And uh, this will be ideal for uh, application backfilling use cases and also uh, quickly hydrating new applications to uh, catch up with the latest application state. So those are the... Uh, Potentially, uh, business use cases uh, we can build based on this cloud-first uh, storage model. Of course, there are certain other scenarios as well, but this will serve as a, a couple of starting points. Now, let's look at what are the potential benefits you can gain from this uh, cloud-first architecture. Uh, obviously, so this will uh, significantly reduce your total cost of ownership uh, when running a streaming data platform in production. So this is made possible in several ways, especially uh, uh, since by uh, not having uh, always on uh, DR uh, infrastructure, so you can uh, spin up, spin it up in on demand and have uh, RPOs closer, close, closer to see. Uh, uh, zero, and then uh, you don't have to spend more on uh, over provision hardware. Uh, whenever you see a demand spike, uh, spike in your traffic, you can uh, quickly provision a cluster and get it done. Uh, also, you can quickly decommission it as well. So you don't have to pay additional for uh, over provisioned uh, resources. Also, with this uh, intelligent uh, rack awareness and, and intelligent uh, cost of optimal cost regional uh, data transfer optimization, it will save more cloud spend in uh, uh, cost as well. So we have seen a uh, couple of our customers uh, uh, achieved lower TCO as much as closer to 1.7 million at one time. So this is the first benefit you will get as a business in production. And then uh, the ability to quickly scale up and scale down, as I mentioned, to meet demand and while having uh, uh, zero downtime and uh, also uh, mini, uh, delivering, ensuring the SLAs. So this will be ideal for uh, handling spikes, spiky workloads, especially uh, without uh, having always on uh, infrastructure in place. Another uh, use case would be to have a separation of concerns. Uh, for example, you can uh, segregate workloads in, for different clusters. For example, you can dedicate uh, uh, clusters with more resources for handling uh, priority one workloads and user-facing applications, while uh, you can dedicate, we can, you can create a read replica to satisfy other non-priority workloads like analytics or 
uh, fulfilling or more streaming data pipelines or a few other things. All right, so those are the uh, things I wanted to cover. So we first started from the uh, uh, storage fundamentals. We talk about the evolution of a storage model uh, from in the beginning to, to uh, modern days. And then we talk about the, the different uh, storage architectures. We have uh, append-only model and in databases we have random access model. And then we talk about different ways of uh, uh, storing data so we can have local storages. And then we discuss about tiered storage and there were some shortcomings. So we propose cloud-first storage as the uh, uh, modern and future-proofing your uh, data architecture. And uh, so as far as Red Panda is concerned, uh, so uh, cloud-first storage is uh, Red Panda's default uh, storage model. And there are so many use cases you can build on top of this uh, cloud storage uh, architecture. Uh, the key thing to you have to keep in mind is uh, cloud is your single source of truth when it comes to uh, data. So you can it may this model makes your data portable and uh, you can uh, make it quickly spin up new clusters and let them uh, catch up with the past state uh, within few seconds. So those are the uh, benefits that uh, this model gives you to your business application. So thanks for joining and we can take a couple of questions from now. So we have a question regarding Will the data that will be stored in the real time on the cloud will be encrypted or not? So yes, again, so it will be encrypted. So you can, so there are certain mechanisms you can enforce uh, uh, en uh, encryption keys. So we can configure mutual TLS and few other ways. So yeah, so the answer is yes. So there's a, another question, how many servers are needed to create a cluster? So as far as talking about uh, Red Panda, so you need, uh, you can quickly get, uh, get started with a single node Red Panda cluster, but uh, most of the time we recommend, uh, if you are deploying it in production, at least three, we need at least three nodes uh, to get started in the production. Uh, so there's another question uh, regarding, so is it DLT? I, I suppose this is about dead letter topics, uh, but this is different. Uh, dead letter topics, uh, so dead letter topics, uh, so once you put a message into a dead letter topic, so you have to manually reprocess it. And uh, it is mostly uh, not, not the part of the uh, streaming data platform's responsibility. So it should be undertaken by the application developer itself. But here, we use cloud storage as a default storage. That means once you send a message to the streaming data platform, it will be stored in the uh, cloud uh, storage bucket first, if configured. And it will be governed by, the lifecycle of that record will be governed by the streaming data platform as well. So that's a major difference. Yes, so there's, Another question, can it be used as an uh, edge compute? Yes, so there's a possibility of uh, deploying uh, this in uh, resource constrained environment like edge. And uh, so that, that's one good use case for that as well. Uh, so uh, you can configure that edge uh, cluster to uh, write to uh, some sort of a cloud if there's a need. And then uh, uh, later, this the data in the cloud can be consumed or aggregated by a central uh, aggregation cluster. So that could we can think of that as a additional use case as well. So there's another question: Can we apply any filter on the data while fetching from cloud storage? So that's a good question. So again, uh, there's no specific uh, uh, filtration method. So it as a consumer, all you see is the Kafka Consume API. 
So you control your uh, filter by setting the offsets. And uh, uh, if there's a need, you can build uh, filtering into your consumer application. For example, if you are building a stream processing application, you can build filters there as well. How is the latency? So there's another question. How is the latency of cloud storage compared to faster local disk? So the, uh, that's again a valid question. Uh, of course, the local disks are more faster always. So, so there's a concern in latency when we read from the uh, cloud storage, but we have a built-in cache, uh, read side cache to speed up that process. So when uh, so that cache also associate with this uh, shadow indexing mechanism, like I mentioned in the uh, architecture diagram. Uh, so whenever this shadow indexing moves a specific segment into the uh, cloud store, it keeps an entry in the index, and uh, by uh, and then uh, when you re request that uh, log segment uh, from the Red Panda, we can quickly uh, look after look for that. Uh, where this uh, log segment re resides in the, the location and we can quickly load it and we can cache it locally so that we don't have to go over and over again to uh, uh, go there uh, to fetch that data. So that's how we optimize the loading time of uh, these uh, cloud storage objects. So another question, three nodes, three servers. So yes, so if you deploy on EC2, could be. And uh, Red Panda comes in different form factors. Uh, so this, this could be three containers as well, or three Docker containers, or in Kubernetes as well. So. Uh, so another question, can you explain more about shadow indexing? Uh, I think I have covered shadow indexing, but I'll quickly go through that. So shadow indexing is the mechanism that uh, automatically uh, moves the uh, segments to from local storage to the uh, cloud storage. So that happens asynchronously and happens uh, transparent to the user. Uh, that means as an operator or a user, uh, you don't have to worry about that, and uh, it will take it will be taken care of by this shadow indexing mechanism. So whenever you so the uh, whenever this mechanism uh, moves a log segment to the cloud, so so it will indexes this uh, uh, which log segments has been moved to which location. So there's a indexing. So this indexing will be uh, instrumental in reading that segment back. So. Also, when we read it back, we have this read side cache. Uh, so there are uh, uh, lots of lot of information. So you can uh, learn a lot for, for about this uh, shadow indexing in Red Panda blog. So we have a couple of uh, uh, in-depth articles uh, explaining uh, shadow indexing. I can share that uh, after this uh, webinar. I think that's all question we got so far. Um, uh, so I think can do, uh, I, with that, uh, I would like to hand it over to the NAC Foundation uh, to take it from there. And thanks all for the uh, uh, joining the session and hope it was uh, uh, useful for you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Judith, for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.